Good afternoon and welcome to the 119th of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today, we will talk about COVID-19 in the air, the water, and on surfaces with environmental engineer, Chuck Haas. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID calls on Facebook Live and on Periscope. You can hear COVID calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID calls. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and topics, and please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, September 3rd, 2020, there are 26,123,176 confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center, that's up from 25 million 835,301 cases reported yesterday. Of those, 6,135,796 are in the United States. That's up from 6,086,747 reported yesterday. There are now a total of 186,392 deaths reported in the United States from COVID-19, up from 184,974 yesterday, continuing the trend of more than a thousand deaths day by day. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic. And I'd like to continue that now. Headline, Tom Seaver, pitcher who led Miracle Mets to Glory Dies at 75 by Bruce Weber. This appeared in the New York Times yesterday. Tom Seaver, one of baseball's greatest right-handed power pitchers, a Hall of Famer who won 311 games for four major league teams, most notably the Mets, whom he led from last place to a surprise world championship in his first three seasons, died on Monday. He was 75. The cause was complications of Louis body dementia and COVID-19, according to the Baseball Hall of Fame. At six foot one and 200 pounds, give or take a few with a thick waist and tree trunk legs that help generate the velocity on his fastball and hard slider and the spin on his curveball, Seaver at work was a picture of kinetic grace. He had a smooth windup, a leg kick with his left knee raised high and a stride so long after pushing off the mound that his right knee often grazed the dirt. With precise control, he had swing and miss stuff. He struck out more than 200 batters in 10 different seasons a National League record, and on April 22, 1970, facing the San Diego Padres, he struck out a record 10 batters in a row to end the game. His total of 3,640 strikeouts in his 20 big league seasons is sixth on the career list. He was also a cerebral sort, a thinker who studied opposing hitters and pored over the details of each pitch, its break, its speed, its location. As he aged and his arm strength diminished, it was his strategic thinking and experience that extended his career. Seaver pitched for the Cincinnati Reds, the Chicago White Sox, and the Boston Red Sox during the second half of his career, winning more than 100 games, including his only no-hitter with the Reds against the St. Louis Cardinals in 1978. Even so, the seasons he spent away from New York seem like little more than a footnote because few players in baseball history have had the impact on the team that Seaver had on the Mets. He was the team's first bona fide star, known to New York fans as Tom Terrific, and more tellingly, the franchise. The team was established five years before he arrived and had not finished higher than ninth in the 10-team National League. Even then, the Mets had quickly earned a reputation for ineptitude. Until his rival, no Mets pitcher had ever won more than 13 games in a season. Seaver won 16 his first year and 16 more the next. He was the league's rookie of the year in 1967. He was an all-star nine times in 10 full seasons with the Mets. He had five seasons with more than 20 wins for the team. All those achievements notwithstanding, there is no heroic Tom Seaver narrative without 1969, a year the so-called Miracle Mets won the World Series. During the championship season, 
when he expressed his view that the United States should get out of Vietnam, it was newsy, especially after protesters on moratorium day, October 15th, 1969, the same day as the fourth game of the World Series, distributed literature with his picture on it at Shea Stadium. George Thomas Seaver was born in Fresno, California, November 17th, 1944. Youngest of four children, his parents were both athletes. His father, Charles, who worked as an executive for the Bonner Packing Company, a producer and marketer of dried fruit, played football and basketball at Stanford and was an accomplished amateur golfer. His mother, Betty Lee, an excellent golfer herself, played basketball in high school. By the fall of 1963, Sieber was in a Marine Reserve unit and attending Fresno City College. He had grown two inches and put wrangling raisins in boot camp and, and wrangling raisins in his father's business and boot camp had put 30 pounds on his frame. So when he went out to pitch for the school team, he was throwing 90 mile per hour fastballs. In the summer of 1964, he played in an Alaskan collegiate league for the Alaska Gold Panners in Fairbanks. He did well enough to earn a scholarship to the University of Southern California. Sieber, who was studying dentistry, was the best pitcher on USC's roster, and he was drafted by the Dodgers in 1965. In a much recounted story, the scout, Tommy Lasorda, later the Dodgers manager, offered him a $2,000 signing bonus. In response, Sieber asked for $50,000. Good luck in your dental career, Lasorda reportedly told him, and the possibility of his becoming a Dodger vanished. Sieber pitched one season in the minor leagues in Jacksonville, Florida, before joining the Mets. After his retirement, Tom Seaver worked as an announcer for both the Mets and the Yankees and eventually moved back to California, where he and his wife established a winery in Calistoga, Seaver Vineyards. Okay, I'd like to turn to our conversation for today, and I'm very excited to bring on my guest and my colleague and friend, Charles Haas. Chuck Haas is the LD Betts Professor of Environmental Engineering and head of the Department of Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering at Drexel University in Philadelphia, where he has been since 1991. He also has a courtesy appointment in the Department of Emergency Medicine of the Drexel University College of Medicine and in the School of Public Health. He co-directed the US EPA DHS University Cooperative Center of Excellence, the Center for Advancing Microbial Risk Assessment. He is a fellow of the International Water Association, the American Academy for the Advancement of Science, the Society for Risk Analysis, the American Society of Civil Engineers, the American Academy of Microbiology, and the Association of Environmental Engineering and Science Professors. He's board certified environmental engineering member by eminence of the American Academy of Environmental Engineers. Over his career, Professor Haas has specialized in the assessment of risk from and control of human exposure to pathogenic microorganisms, and in particular, the treatment of water and wastewater to minimize microbial risk to human health. And I will add to this, um, he's an expert in all of these fields and he's an expert science communicator. And so I'm really thrilled to have him on today. Chuck, thanks for making time to come on COVID calls. Thank you, Scott. Let me just, you know, your, your reading of the old bit of Tom Seaver uh, touched me in a lot of ways. Um, 1969 was my freshman year. And so in essence, I'm a friend and I grew up in Queens. Oh. So, um, you know, I'm a child of the Miracle Mets. I didn't even read the whole story of that season. That full of <laughs> that full obituary in the Times is like three thousand words long. I mean, they yeah. really they talk about that whole season. And uh, since you shared that, my grandfather was a big fan of the Mets. Um, he always liked underdog teams, even though he lived in Texas. He was a, a Mets fan, and I grew up hearing about Tom Seaver. And it was one of the first baseball cards I ever bought was a Tom Seaver card because he, my grandfather had built him up as this great champion of the underdog player. So thanks for sharing that. Um, Chuck, I wanna just start by asking you a question. I always ask folks, where are you calling from and, and uh, what's the pandemic looking like there today? So I'm home sitting in my, my study overlooking the uh, Delaware River in the north end of Center City. and um, I basically have not been off our property since the middle of March. So you're in Philadelphia and you have a view out, you can see the world around you, but you have been pretty much locked down there the whole time, huh? Yep. 
what's the situation in Philadelphia? We haven't checked in with anybody in Philly in the in the last recent time. So at least in in our neighborhood, there's been you know good compliance of people outdoors with masking. Um, you know, at this in this part of the city, the positivity rate has has been moderate, um, not as extreme as parts of North Philly, North Philly and West Philly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people are compliant, but we also have not been in any indoor stores or so forth, except for our small market in our condo um, since March. Mm -hmm. When you, um, we'll come to a bit more discussion as we go on about how you actually pull data together, but even, you know, the story you just told about Philadelphia is a complicated set of smaller stories mm -hmm. about COVID-19. What kind of data sources are you relying on for that, Chuck? Well, there's there's county level data that we've looked at, which um, actually I think has been scraped together by the New York Times, which we're able to pull down to do analysis. Um, you know, the Hopkins website is good. There's a good site at UC Davis. Um, and there's some interesting statistical uh, measurements that are on the Georgia Tech site. So a variety of data sources that we've looked at, we haven't really drilled down to the sub-city level. I know we have colleagues at Drexel that have been doing that actively, and that shows some interesting disparities. So you've been very active, um, not only as a department head and a teacher, but also speaking with the media about um, particularly some of these more techni technical issues around transmission. And you told the Inquirer in a recent article um, you ticked off the important measures to keep in mind universal masking, avoid crowds, avoid confined spaces, keep a physical distance, and for indoor spaces, improve ventilation. So we've heard those things, but rarely do we get behind the story on those anymore. I think early on in the pandemic, there was a fair amount of news coverage on some aspects of that, but it feels to me that we haven't seen as much recently. So I'd kind of like to go with some with you on some of these in more detail. And if you don't mind, maybe starting with with distancing and crowds. Mm -hmm. so what does the research tell us right now about how far away we need to be from, from people and in what contexts? Well, so I think, you know, what you really need to do is to view all the measures as one integral unit. There's no magic bullet. Um, you know, some people use what's called the Swiss cheese analogy. If you imagine slices of Swiss cheese uh, with holes in them, if you get all the holes aligned, you know, something is going to slip through. But if you sort of turn each slice of Swiss cheese at an angle, so the holes no longer align, you hope that that set of individual barriers, which in and of themselves may be imperfect, will form a much more tighter barrier to whatever challenges pass through. So, you know, masks are not perfect. Distance is not perfect. Plexiglass barriers are not perfect. Ventilation is not perfect. But we hope that when we combine all of those together, we'll get a high degree of protection of exposure of people to any sources of infection that could occur. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the, the six foot distance itself, that kind of has an interesting history. And um, the best that we've been able to trace back, and I've when I say we, there's a broad network of colleagues that have been sort of self-assembling on social media over the past couple of months. Um, that really stems from some research that goes back probably to the 19 teens mm -hmm. um, on what the measurement is. Essentially, if you speak loudly, there are large particles that can come from you when you speak or from when you cough. And many of those large particles tend to fall to the ground over short distance. But what's really been found more recently is when people speak or cough or sneeze, there's a broad spectrum of particles that get emitted. Some drop down fairly readily, but some can persist out to 20 or even 30 feet. Mm -hmm. 
So there's a continuum. So six foot uh, is is a baseline for some percentage of the particles that are going to come out when a person is is exactly speaking. okay exactly just a reference and, point and and hopefully that's a reference point for the particles that might directly deposit on your face from somebody or your uh, mouth or nose. Um, but beyond that, there are other materials that can be emitted that can potentially have virus in them. I saw a, a news article not long ago, you may remember this one or similar articles that did seem to be picking up on that. And so the suggestion was um, the best way to be in a crowd is silent. And the next best way is to be speaking maybe in a, in a low voice. And yes. what we should avoid is yelling um, or speaking loudly, which is on my mind considering, you know, I talked with uh, Billy Witz of the New York Times a couple days ago and talking about football season starting in the South. And they're going to put 25,000 people in these stadiums, which is a 75% reduction, but expect them to sit there, I guess, quietly. I don't, I don't know. It's, 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 <laughs> Again, raising some of these challenges yeah. about how you communicate risk, yep. even if people want to try, it seems like there's a lot of contradiction in the messaging. And it's not purely distance. And I think this is, you know, part of the discussion about, um, you know, to use that rally in Tulsa as an example, compared to some of the uh, street rallies for BLM, mm -hmm. you know, indoors is, is worse than outdoors. You get more circulation outdoors, more dispersion, plus the whole issue of mask wearing in those two venues. Let's turn to the indoors mm -hmm. then. Um, what do we know and what do we not know about the same sort of problems, um, how particles move in indoor spaces and, and how far apart people should be? And I guess it's also mitigated by the fact that if you have wind and atmospherics outdoors, we have ventilation, HVAC you know, indoors, and, and people moving in and out of spaces that are of vastly irregular, you know, they're in hallways, and then they're in big rooms, and then they're in small rooms. It seems incredibly complicated to me. Can you take break that down for us a little bit? Well, it is, and I think the easiest thing to, to think of this as is there are two mechanisms for material to get from a potentially infected person to a susceptible person. One is these large particles that can directly land on your, you know, eyes or nose or mouth, and you can be exposed to that directly. The other are small particles that may stay in the air for a period of time and get mixed with the ambient environment. Mm. Um, the role of the spacing and the plexiglass barriers uh, and in the medical context, uh, face shields is to prevent that direct deposition of the large particles. Uh, the role of ventilation is more to deal with the small particles, to be sure that there's enough mixing and dilution of the air so that the concentration of those small particles drop down to a low value. So there are two mechanisms of exposure, and those are two ways of dealing with that potential risk. So give us examples of different types of indoor spaces and particularly on that second problem of small particles. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you're in an average office building, for example, is there enough airflow going through to deal with the problem of small, small particles um, or a classroom to break that let's, down for us? You know, let, let's talk about classrooms, which you and I obviously both know well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have a, uh, a classroom packed to full capacity, you'll place more demand on the system. Uh, and in fact, people have measured, so you can measure carbon dioxide in a room. Mm. And people have measured carbon dioxide in classrooms that are at capacity. And you see the carbon dioxide levels increase significantly mm. due to people exhaling air. Right. And you know, one of the ideas of de-densifying classrooms during the COVID uh, pandemic is that you can reduce the force of the individual demand on the ventilation system to reduce the concentration of aerosols that might be in the room. And you can measure that by also reduce, by also measuring carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. And if CO2 levels are low, 
then presumably the potential for accumulation of any viral particles will be low as well. So those are metrics that we need to start uh, looking at. Traditionally, occupancy has been based primarily on ability to escape from a room in case of fire. But, you know, I think in, in the face of COVID, we need to start considering occupancy in terms of um, ventilation demand. And people are looking at the six foot spacing in classrooms may not necessarily be um, a risk reduction strategy due to the distance per se, but it ha has the effect of de-densification and therefore ah. reducing demand on the ventilation system. Okay, so this is why I always enjoy talking with you because you take like very complicated science and bring it down to it, you know, for a humanist to, to understand that. I particularly like the analogy to fire. So we think about occupancy, you know, you walk into a room, if you're like me, because I studied the history of fire, I look, in, I look to see if there's sprinklers and I look to see where the exits are and I look to see what right. the occupancy number is. You're saying we may be moving into a time and there's going to be another thing we should be looking for, another occupancy sign even perhaps Absolutely. or something like that. Absolutely. And analogous to sprinklers, which is a good one, you know, look at whether or not you can open windows in classrooms mm -hmm. and look at whether or not the ventilation system has uh, filtration to remove particles. I mean, you know, you, you and I can name any number of classrooms at Drexel with non-openable windows. Right. We need, or even, you know, with no windows at all, typically interior classrooms. We need to get away from that. Mm. So um, just to come back to the this issue around um, airflow in these kind of in these kind of situations, um, what are the recommendations if it needs to be increased? I mean, is this something that can be handled in an ad hoc sort of way with individual rooms? Or are we talking about you know universities or office buildings or hospitals having to overhaul their full HVAC systems? Well, you know, perhaps a little bit of both. So, you know, first of all, um, one of the key organizations in this space is ASHRAE, the American Society for Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. And they've actually outlined a whole series of uh, retrofitting uh, specifications for offices, for classrooms, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So some of it can be done at the central facilities level. <clears throat> um, in terms of increasing ventilation, increasing filtration, increasing openable windows. But there are also, when that can't be done, there are uh, portable air cleaners that one can put into rooms that can filter the air in a room to get a reasonably high degree of particle removal um, on a room-to-room -room basis. So it can be a mix of different strategies. The, de the devil is in the details. So sticking with this a little bit more, what kind of um, what kind of similar situations when you think about modeling this, are there other cases you can think about where particles in air have raised this kind of level of concern, maybe even in workplaces? I'm thinking perhaps of um, you know silicon particles or asbestos or other things where there's been study that kind of, that you're building on to make these kind of inferences, or are you having to build this research and science from scratch? Well, I mean, a lot of it is basic basic ventilation models. So, um, you know, the government agency in this space is NIST, um, National Institute of Standards and Technology, and they actually have a very detailed set of uh, computational models to model how smoke disperses in various mm -hmm. interior spaces. And so those smoke models have been and are being repurposed to study how aerosols of various sorts disperse in interior spaces. You're on mute, Scott. We have one of our listeners just uh, contributed this point, and it's, a, of course, a good one. And again, to come back, if people are working in universities that have um, you know, like any university and most big institutions, it's a mix. There's old buildings and there's new buildings. Um, and, you know, the assumption is, I guess, that the HVAC system may be, may struggle in an older 
uh, classroom or an older office building. Is that a is that a good assumption? I mean, I'm, we, we, we once again intersect with a conversation you and I have had over the years about infrastructure and deferred maintenance of infrastructure. Is it catching up with us here yet again? Well, so actually it's interesting. It, it sort of depends. And, you know, in old buildings, they were most often designed with openable windows. And so you can open the windows. And in fact, also in old buildings, you know, and I can attest to that because my office, as you know, is in one of the older buildings in Drexel. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of leakage, even if you don't open the windows. So, you know, in old buildings, both of those aspects wind up being good for ventilation. In new buildings, very often windows were not designed to be open. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you can look at old versus new per se. Um, on average, you're probably right that newer buildings the, the the mechanical aspects of the buildings are better designed, but the other aspects of the buildings may play into a better case for ventilation. So are engineers who specialize in this, like in ventilation and air conditioning, HVAC, and they must be completely working 24-7 right now. These the, people must you know, mechanical engineers and architectural engineers, which is one of the specialties in my department, yes, there's been a lot of a lot of interest in the field. Yeah, I can imagine. Let me ask you another thing I've been thinking about, particularly with um, discussions around reopening um, different f kinds of facilities. Um, this may not be so much about spread of COVID, but about other pollutants, um, things that might be in HVAC systems or in buildings that have been sitting for some months, and now you crank the systems back on. Is that is that wrong? Have those systems been on the whole time in most places and so we don't have to worry about that? Or, you know, or what what do we have to think about when you do a restart of a building, let's say? Uh, you know, that's, that's an interesting question. I haven't heard of that particular discussion for the ventilation system, although interestingly enough, it has been occurring for the water system. Okay. Um, you know, buildings and schools that have had low occupancy basically have had stagnant water in them. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that can happen in, in water stagnation is you grow a lot of bacteria in the water pipes, including Legionella. And so there really is a lot of concern for flushing the building piping before you restart and reoccupy. And I think there have been already been um, a couple of clusters of school-related outbreaks due to Legionnaires from pipe stagnation without adequate flushing prior to reoccupancy. So you brought up water, so let's let's turn to that for a second, then we'll, we'll come back to air. But um, there's been some research and a few stories have broken through into mainstream media around wastewater and measuring wastewater as a way to get a handle on infection. Um, and I've been eager to talk to you uh, to see if this is something that needs to be debunked, or is this actually being used as a as a as a methodology? No, it is it is being used. Um, you know, I I checked. I'm on a Slack group that discusses this, and I checked it before the call. There are over 600 people on the Slack group on wastewater based epidemiology for COVID. Um, it's being used um, citywide. It's being used at universities on an individual building scale, and it's being used in a couple of cities on a, let's say, neighborhood scale. So the idea is, although this is not a virus that necessarily um, infects the gastrointestinal tract, waste from people can contain the RNA, the nucleic acid of the virus, if people have been infected. And it's now been shown pretty clearly that that tends to correlate and maybe even precede an onset of cases. Yeah. So there was just an example last week, at University of Arizona, where um, there was measurements of individual dormitory buildings, and they caught a high positive rate in one of the dorm buildings and were able to track it down to a couple of infected students in the dorm. No kidding. Yep. Is that kind of monitoring expensive? Is it complicated? Well, it's it's so it is complicated, and we're we're talking about getting it set up at Drexel. Um, 
you know, expensive. So I can tell you that there is um, at least one company in this space, and I've been told they're charging anywhere but that from a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars per sample. Okay, and so it's done. Like, give us a sense of how it, it's something you would literally do it day by day. You would do it so once in a while, or you know, if if we were to do if we were to do it at university, um, you know, we could find. Uh, manholes or sewer locations where we could sample wastewater from uh, buildings or from a cluster of buildings. We might want to sample every couple days, um, you know, on a campaign, you know, for the cluster of the building. And then if we see an increase above uh, some prior baseline level, it would be a signal to do more detailed uh, deep dives into what's happening within that building or the cluster. Are there any, um, ethical concerns about this kind of monitoring? Do people, I mean, I don't know, do people have rights to to know if their wastewater is being assessed? I, I, it's, it's something I hadn't really thought of much um, until I thought about this call. No, and I think I think people are starting to, to think about that. There are actually a couple of um, papers written on this, mostly from the legal point of view rather than the scholarly point of view. And, you know, Let's think of two extreme cases. So, you know, if I if I measure the entire wastewater of the city, you know, clearly I can't track that down to individual, but I get a snapshot of the the population aggregate history of um, COVID nineteen uh, in that population. And by the way, this was used years ago for uh, drug monitoring. You can actually monitor, for example, opium residues and wastewater and get at that. Um, if I were to monitor an individual's toilet, that would clearly require informed consent, IRB approval, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the real question is where's the transition zone, you know, between the ultra large and the individual. And I think it's something we do need to start to think about. Um, and in fact, I just sent a, an email to, our colleague Mike Udell about this. Um, you know, I think it's it's worth discussing. I don't know what the answer is, but um, you know, I think we need to start considering that. So just to remind folks, you're listening to COVID calls, having a discussion today with Chuck Haas, and and thus far we've been talking a lot about um, it's kind of uh, structural and infrastructural issues around assessing and preventing COVID-19 spread. I got a question in here from Jorge Benavides Rawson a loyal listener, and, and I think it's a great question. You know, some of the things we were just talking about now, um, how long do you think, not just will they be adopted into, into practice and buildings, but into, into policies and standards? You're an expert on these kind of things, on how air quality standards are, are formed and water quality standards are formed. Are we operating on an emergency basis now? Can these things be implemented quite quickly? So, let me talk about air, indoor air versus water for a moment. So in the U.S., you know, we do have a, a fairly extensive set of regulations for water quality. And in fact, some of them even pertain down to the building level. Uh, you know, so for example, lead, you know, and the issues around lead and corrosion are regulated ultimately at the individual tap level of a building. There's been a great hesitancy to have any regulations in indoor air mm. for anything. Um, you know, really going back to the issue of radon, which is one of the first um, uh, major pollutants that was attributable to indoor air exposure. Um, so we don't have indoor air regulations per se. I think what we have instead is uh, standards of practice. And so implementation is going to be more likely not due in the U.S., not due to regulation, but recognition of what a standard of practice or standard of care is. Mm. And the fact that ASHRAE has entered into this really gives something defensible to point to as a standard of care. So what will be interesting to see is whether or not uh, insurance companies mm. start to consider 
different classes of buildings by how well they adhere to these standards of care. I mean, there's so much happening there. Assumptions that even after a vaccine is achieved, that COVID-19 or other coronavirus in the future might become, and we've heard this from epidemiologists, might just become a sort of standard feature of our lives yeah. more and more. And, and, and the, the other thing I'll mention is some of the things that we've talked about, ventilation, for example. There have been a lot of studies that suggested increasing the ventilation in office buildings increases occupant satisfaction and productivity. Mm -hmm. And so these might have been things that we should be doing all along anyway right. uh, because of other concerns. And this may be the impetus to move in that direction more and more. Let me stay with this a little bit because, you know, people who study engineering and the interface between engineering and law know that standards formation, particularly in the United States, is not just done by government fiat. It's a highly complicated dance between scientists, interest groups, it, some of them including insurance companies, deep pocketed interests, as well as nonprofit interests, and engineers um, who are also working sometimes in public settings and sometimes in private settings. And you must have been thinking a lot about this and you taught a class about coronavirus and engineering. And I'm wondering if you talked about this, the ethical demands on engineers at this time, everything we've just been talking about now presumes that engineers, capital E, are aware of these debates, interested in public health, willing to take a stand if necessary, even if it's an unpopular uh, stand, it's going to cause a building owner or an institution money. I don't even know how to get into this question. It's so vast, but let's just talk about it a little bit. The, the ethical demands of, of coronavirus on an engineer. Well, I would say the ethical demands in engineering to begin with. So, in fact, I give, I give a lecture to our seniors on ethics. And, you know, historically in, in engineering, um, when a lot of people teach engineering ethics, they teach it solely in terms of the duty of engineers to to clients and to each other. And, you know, that, that often is called microethics. Um, you know, the aspect of ethics that I've been interested in often goes by the name of macroethics. You know, what are the duties of engineers to to the public writ large? And I think that's really what you're asking. Um, you know, American Society of Civil Engineers is a code of ethics and Canon one of the code of ethics says that the, um, the primary responsibility is to safety, health and welfare of the environment and the public. And, you know, I think engineers need to internalize that. And it may very well be that if there's a conflict, they need to act on that. And that's an important thing for engineers to recognize. You're not simply, you're not simply doing a job for a client, but in doing so you have a responsibility to the broader community. And so we need to inculcate that in that in engineers um, even more effectively and COVID points that out. So you've already given some examples um, in issues around, let's say, transparency of how risk assessment might work or monitoring mm -hmm. might work, or if president of a company or a university asks an engineer, consulting engineer, you know, what do you really think about airflow in this in this building? At, I'm thinking, though, also about, you know, imagine, you know, the president is at the DACE and Tony Fauci is there on one side. Um, Engineers should be part of these public health conversations as well. I think they've been a little overshadowed at this at this time. What are some of the other things? I mean, I'm thinking about train travel, you know, travel generally, uh, transportation. Um, I'm thinking about, um, again, the sort of occupancy issues we were just talking about, or even decisions about whether or not to reopen a facility. Um, have you... I guess, again, I'd like to get a scan from you. Do you see engineers sort of elbowing their way into these conversations or are they consulted? What's happening? I, I, think, they, I think they need to be. And in fact, the interesting thing, and um, you, know, you and I have talked about history of science and engineering a lot. There used to be a very, very well-recognized discipline called public health engineering. 
And that has sort of, at least in the US, disappeared from view. And I think it needs to really come back to the fore because that's what you're really talking about. How do engineers um, engage in what we need to do to protect public health? I'm gonna bring a question up from a colleague we both know. Um, and this is gonna stick with this area of sort of uh, expertise and, and, and ethics. And her question is, you know, thinking back to the spring, how realistic did you think it was that transmission could be lowered in classrooms and dorms? So we're talking about universities here. Um, over the summer months to make it such that we could have a campus return. We don't have to talk just about our institution. We can talk about institutions generally, but I think this is, you know, this is what was happening over the summer on college campuses and task forces and often involving, as I understand it, faculty from nursing schools, medical schools, public health schools, and engineering departments. So what do you, what were your thoughts then? What are your thoughts now? Well, so I think there are two issues, you know, in a way universities are victims of what's happening in the broader society. And, you know, I think there was a potentially a hope that community level prevalence could be reduced further than it was able to be. Um, you know, we've seen in, in Europe where, uh, and in Asia certainly, where community level prevalence was reduced more substantially than the US, they have had better reopenings. But even from the outset, and there was a, um, couple of studies that go back, I think, to March that talked about a hammer and dance strategy, mm -hmm. where the strategy for reopening was to drive down the case burden very dramatically by the hammer. And then once that occurred, we'd be dancing around mm -hmm. until we got a, um, you know, a vaccine or find a way to, to prevent cases. Um, we never succeed in hammering it down in the U.S. large enough. So I think that's that's one issue um, that occurred. And the other issue is we were probably not realistic enough in understanding the degree to which bringing back, unfortunately, we avoided it at Drexel and, you know, Penn avoided it, but we just saw that what happened to Temple mm -hmm. uh, points out the uh, fallacy. Um, I don't think we understood the degree to which non-university exposure and intermingling would act as a um, big draw to undergraduates that were cooped up for months right. and result in another substantial set of uh, nuclei for transmission. And that's what you're seeing now with these reports, I mean, from Temple, but also from Penn State I'm, and South Carolina and everywhere across the country that's been I trying. mean, my, my, my doctoral alma mater, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, probably had, has one of the most aggressive testing strategies of any university in the country. And their, their case counts are starting to increase substantially, and it's worrisome. We had Sheldon Jacobson on last week to talk about the Illinois strategy. It was interesting to talk to him and he talked, I mean, and it really is. I mean, it, it's interesting you talk about that, the hammer and the dance discussion, the way he described it, they, they were gonna treat the Illinois campus itself with the hammer. In other words, the idea that you right. could take a smaller subset of the general environment and you could take these extreme measures doesn't seem like that's possible as long as community spread is as is, is prevalent as it is? Is that the way you're seeing it right now? I think as long as community spread is out there and uh, universities in particular, as long as there's not a more aggressive messaging about the extracurricular intermingling of students. Okay. Just want to remind folks that uh, talking to Chuck Haas on COVID calls and you can get your questions in to the YouTube live chat, or you can put them up on Twitter, just tag at US of Disaster or email me directly if you want, sgk23 at drexel.edu. I wanna come back, let's come back a little bit to, I wanna talk about masks with you. And um, you gave an interview in the New York Times, you told them that you were talking about this mask issue and, and, and how it interlaces with the risk perception issue and it's gotten extremely political too. But you, you told the Times there's been a deficiency in the messaging about masking to say that it only protects the other. Right. Um, 
and you said you told them from the get-go that never made sense scientifically yet another layer of all this mask dispute is people's own perception of who they're helping when they wear right the mask break this down for us a little bit um, well so i think the you know the mask messaging issue has been problematic i think you know early on as we've come to recognize one of the reasons why they were discouraging use of masks was to preserve the um, PPE, which, which was in short supply for the healthcare workers. And they should have just been honest up front. You know, you're not, you're not going to be able to re, regain trust if you're not honest from the get-go. Mm -hmm. So that's one issue. And the other issue with, with masking is, uh, you know, maybe I'm a cynic, but I think particularly in the U.S., selfishness is more of a, a virtue than altruism. Mm. And so by telling people you're only going, you, the purpose of masking is to protect the other. You're saying, well, you're doing this for them. And I think it would have been better if they said you're doing this for everybody, both you and them. Mm. And that way you're telling people you're affording protection to yourself. But simply on a, on, a, on a pure physics point of view, you know, a, a mask has two sides. And there's no reason to say why it works better one way than the other. Mm. It should work the same way both. Right. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of misunderstanding of what's happening with masks, I think, on the part of some of the people who are messaging the public health um, communication. We've talked a lot about risk perception and risk communication on COVID calls, but I'd like to get your take on it since you study it well. Um, even as you said early on, if the idea was we have a limited amount of PPE and the stockpile is empty and all of the logistical problems we faced, um, mm -hmm. who does who calls the shot on how that risk communication works i mean i know it's happening at the federal level but it seems to me so complicated to know how we would go back and reconstruct how the decisions were made to communicate or not and then and then you change course in the way you communicate i mean it's it to me it just seems very opaque to understand where we would we want to learn from these mistakes and do better how will you reconstruct the mistakes <laughs> well i think you're as asking two separate questions. You know, I think clearly at some point down the road, whenever that is, there's going to need to be a lot of reconstruction for what happened when. But on the fly, there needed to be better risk communication expertise embedded at WHO, at CDC, and elsewhere mm -hmm. as the messaging was occurring. I mean, Risk, risk perception and risk communication are actual fields of study. Right. And people understand the concept of risk magnification or risk amplification and how to do messaging. And those, there should be more of those people brought in at the early days than there were. This was one of those moments where, and I know you're a student of history too, you know, I was asked in March and April by May, people stopped asking, but uh, you know, what can we learn from history? And and you know, it's pretty easy to point to 1918, particularly in Philadelphia, and say, look, I think there's a lot of pretty good evidence here that um, masking is not perfect, but should be taken seriously as a public health intervention right. at this time. And pretty quickly, that coincided with. I don't know why I'm surprised by anything anymore, but I was surprised by the vehemence of this anti-mask ideology. I don't know how else you describe it. it well, but interestingly enough, if you, you know, I'm sure you've read about what happened in San Francisco during that time period as well. There was a vehement anti-masking league there that, you know, had some of the same messaging that we've seen now. Mm -hmm. So were you, you, you weren't surprised then, or in what ways were you surprised by how quickly a, a sort of a, to many of us, a common sense, like, public health intervention became a talisman for political poli American politics. 
Well, I think I think part of it has to do with the messaging that um, the mask is only to protect the other. Uh-huh. And uh, you know, as I, I said, I mean, uh, for better or worse, um, selfishness is a is a good motivator. And that was clearly not used as a motivation to get people to mask. So um, can you extend that analogy to an institutional level? Do you think this, is, this problem has also plagued institutions that in these discussions around universities, for example, or even sports stadiums or whatever, that, that where they're responsible, like how you actually make the decision um, should it be altruistic? Should it be about the social contract and the broader population, or should it be about protecting their own institution? Does, does this, this problem you're pointing to around what really motivates people to take uncomfortable action, can you scale that up too? You know, I'm sure there are going to be any number of doctoral theses written interviewing college presidents, local mayors, you name it, mm -hmm. as to how and why they made a particular decision. You know, I think for universities, which, you know, obviously you and I know uh, well, I think the motivation is going to be very different in public sector versus private sector. Mm -hmm. Because historically, public universities have, have perceived themselves to have a much greater uh, responsibility to the general community. Um, you know, what's, what's interesting and, and fascinating to me is you see some universities almost acting in total ignorance, not ignorance, disregard of that obligation, although they've been pressured by um, elected state officials right. who clearly don't view um, the problem as serious. So it's contextual as well. Uh, you know, the private university motivation is interesting. I think. Uh, we may very well find that private universities has behaved better in terms of public health performance than than public universities. You know, uh, think of Harvard and Yale and Princeton and you know Penn and you know even even Drexel. We we pulled the plug uh, pretty early. Right. So just want to remind people you're listening to COVID calls. We're talking about air and water and COVID-19, but also about risk perception and ethics. Chuck, I wanted to ask you, you know, you taught this course. Um, can you say a little bit about what it was like to teach coronavirus and to engineers remotely at this time? I'm fascinated. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know your your pedagogy is technical, but also ethical and historical. I'd, I'd love to know kind of what happened in the classroom. The digital well, classroom. I did it. I did it asynchronously. Um, I think the students were clearly eager for knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know, I had them write uh, discussion pieces. I had them do a final, um, final paper connecting what we talked about to their particular disciplines. You know, I had students from pretty much all of the engineering branches in the course, and I think a lot of them didn't realize the connection that their particular branches of engineering had the understanding and solving this particular problem. Mm -hmm. So hopefully I've made them both better citizens and um, able to make the connection between solving the problem that um, you know may be with us for who knows how long. And the, did the students, um, I'm sort of curious, you know, in engineering that they spend, that they should be spending time uh, in their co-ops, out on site, in technical settings, in the lab. Uh, how are they reacting? And I guess you as well. How, how are you all reacting to being out of the out of the lab? I mean, for historians, the parallel question is, how are you doing that you haven't been able to go into the archives? And frankly, I've talked with a lot of yeah. colleagues and they're distressed about it because they're worried that the archives will be shut down. This is another excuse I'm, to defund the spaces where we do our work. So, you know, in, in a way, from a research and scholarship point of view, in a way I've been fortunate because a lot of my research has been computational at this stage. Mm. So, you know, absence from the lab has not been a barrier, although I told you we're talking about scaling up this, this wastewater-based epidemiology at Drexel. And, um, you know, I may need to find my way back to campus to, to try and gear some of that, 
but it, it certainly has been an issue. I mean, I have an experimentalist in my department who have had their students forced to do analysis and review and computational work for the past you know, four or five months and they're slowly getting back into their laboratory and field work. Mm. And they're able to, at this point, they're able to get back into the lab? We're starting to reoccupy. So we're entering, we're entering phase two. And I know we've had a couple of faculty so far file paperwork for that. And I expect uh, about four or five more other, others to file as well. As your department head, how's that working? Is are you the person who has to oversee the the implementation of those uh, the standards and make sure everybody's following the new rules? So it's really a layered layered procedure. Um, you know, the paperwork goes through me and then through our dean's office and then through uh, vice provost for research office, and then they get the approval. Mm. And there are point. health and safety standards that go into that, and they're also doing. A building scale analysis to be sure that no building is um, overly densified. I think we're we're okay now, up to fifty percent. I'm I'm really um, I, I find it tantalizing some of your earlier uh, observations about things that could be learned at this time that we should have already known that might change what how structures are built, how they're ventilated, standards. Right. Do you see a parallel to that in engineering education more generally? Are, are there things, what's happening with engineering schools? You taught a class, I don't know if yep. it was a special topic, but does coronavirus become part of the curriculum now? I, you know, I don't know if this particular class will, um, but, you know, certainly the lessons learned in terms of um, indoor air quality, ventilation and so forth will be assimilated. Uh, you know, you you probably know from your work, Scott, that a lot of engineering progress has been done on the basis of learning from accidents and disasters. And so, you know, this may well be another uh, incident of that. The um, that 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 challenge is one I think a lot about. And you and I have talked about that, and yep. and you even hinted a minute ago to the problem of the reconstruction of this disaster. It's so complicated. It, I mean, to me, I mean, it's I, it's um, also sort of mm -hmm. ironic. I mean, we're all experiencing it simultaneously, but there's so many data points, it's hard to capture it, all right. of it. And we have drawn to the conflicts. We're drawn to the, you know, the people in the streets marching against masks or whatever it may be. But you said the devil's in the details with a lot of this. Yep. I'm worried that the data may not be being well, captured. Well, I, I, you know, I am too, you know, I, you know, you you know my wife is an ABD historian, and I, I wonder how, you know, historians of the future are going to capture all the ephemeral emails and messages and so forth that went behind decision making in the different organizations. You know, wow. you talked about archives. You know, there's no parallel to the written archive for a lot of the ways the modern decisions are getting made. It's especially distressing given this administration's attitude towards inspectors general yeah. and archiving and, and things like that. But the maybe the flip side to that is, um, and you're very active in social media, um, the rapid sharing of information at this time, particularly scientific information, even highly technical, um, has been astounding to me. I mean, you must participate in many different uh -huh. scientific groups that are now fully online. You mentioned a Slack channel for uh -huh. wastewater analysis. Yeah, so I'm, I'll give you the example of the aerosol group. So, you know, for the past, it actually really started back in January. Um, you know, there have been a number of us going back and forth on Twitter about, um, you know, potential aerosol angles to transmission. And I think we self-aggregated a group of probably you know, a dozen or so people who were corresponding seriously about this. And, um, you know, at this point, it's culminated in a variety of outputs, including, you know, an FAQ that just went online last week that was coordinated by a collaborator at University of Colorado. You know, not all of us had met face to face, and we really didn't interact or know each other before, but it was a self organizing group that resulted and produced, I think, that something is going to be uh, very useful. Part of the subtext of what you've been saying um, in our discussion today is it doesn't seem that you think we're going back to some sort of normal, like pre-COVID 
normal, but I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I am curious to know if you think the kinds of changes you've been describing um, in the way buildings are understood, the way risk is assessed and communicated, what's going to stick? What Are we in a COVID era now? Are we, is there any going back to life before January, do you think? You know, we'll, it, it's an overused phrase. We'll find the new normal. I don't know what the new, new normal is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's clearly changed how we work, uh, how we communicate. Um, I don't think we understand all the ramifications yet. I mean, do we need big office buildings anymore? Right. Right. And the masks, I mean, I'm thinking about this now as we as we think about, you know, everybody's putting the vaccine as this sort of technological fix that's going to come. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, are we going to, that it strikes me. There are many other I, elements. I mean, it may, it, you know, the masking may assimilate into our culture. You know, you, yeah. I know you've traveled in Asia a lot. I've traveled in Asia. You know, you see mask wearing uh, much more prevalent in Asia than you do in the U S um, you know, and in fact, I don't know if you, you recall it, I distinctly remember the week before we closed shop in March, you know, walking on Chestnut Street and seeing a number of the uh, Asian students that we have at Drexel mask, mask wearing. Yeah, I remember that and too. it was very apparent that they were reading, reading signals that had not yet been read at that time in the general population in the U.S. So we're almost up on time, Chuck. I just want to get one more question into you is, and it's just, you know, as a person who takes a broad view of engineering and, and risk, what do you really hope will come out of this moment? I mean, obviously we want the pandemic to end. Uh, yes. And to try to get back to whatever this new or get to this new normal you're talking about. What are some of the other changes in science, technology, law, education that you think are revealed now possible within grasp that we may not have seen before I think of this question because what happened with George Floyd and Black Lives Matter, which has coincided with this pandemic, has, you know, some people I've talked to on COVID calls, they've said, you know, this has also opened possibilities that people thought were foreclosed before. I, and so I'm curious if you think that there is a moment of opportunity is not, it's not a great word, but it, it does kind of capture, there are potentially opportunities here to make society safer, I think. Well, there are, and we need to we need to better integrate the, you know, the behavioral elements into, you know, engineering and design, and they often have not been well integrated. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not just building a box or building a um, a roadway or building a uh, building, um, you know, in the absence of people, and we need to look at how how fit for purpose the designs are and what the um, public needs are, the public's needs are for the particular things that get built and designed. And that hasn't been emphasized enough in, uh, in engineering education. I want to remind everybody you've been listening to COVID calls and tomorrow we're going to talk about um, what it's been with a continuation of our discussion today, what it's been like to teach COVID-19 and COVID-19 pedagogy. Uh, so join us for that at five o'clock and join us every weekday at five o'clock Eastern time. We talk to experts about COVID and um, th what we're expecting to come in, in the future. Thanks a lot, Chuck, for joining me on COVID calls today. Really appreciate it. Everybody um, stay healthy. We'll see you tomorrow at five o'clock.